is quite um, profound, as you guys could see, that there's a lot of problems getting that labor. So how do we get somebody who's, let's say, you know, picking at a particular rate, like 90 units per hour, to get them picking at 1,000 units per hour, right? So like 10x that. And those are the systems we're always considering. And that doesn't only goes into the picking problems, it also goes into the returns. That's another huge challenge, especially now um, that's coming in. And we always look at the problem as, you know, this is the random access to SKUs, both input and output. So uh, replenishment is also a problem. So those three things, replenishment, returns, and picking, have been really, really difficult. As that demand grew with COVID, and not only grew, it also had a spiraling effect because more and more people started ordering things online. Uh, a lot of retail stores, unfortunately, had to close. And that brought more and more of that demand into you know, the e-commerce space. And a lot of our customers are really struggling to keep up with not just their demand, but also with the shortage of labor, right? So now most people don't want to be personal shoppers for other people, so they don't last very long in the warehouse. They'll do this for a little while and they come out. So the question is, how do we now create this new world, right, where people can order things online, but not have to have armies of people having, you know, to run the back end and fulfill these right as quickly as possible. And that's where automations comes in. Now, with the pandemic, another aspect that really started um, improving how robots are able to improve this is through the use of being able to adapt into existing infrastructure, existing warehouses. And what, did, what that did is just ex expedited the time that it takes you to deploy the automation, right? In the past, I mean, we had shuttle systems or SRS systems, but it would take years to deploy. They actually took also a lot of resources. Now with very limited resources, with very limited uh, labor, how do you get a system to be up and running at very high productivity within a month? Um, way to think about it is robotics is sort of that next stage of automation where you can deploy things very quickly they can adapt into existing infrastructures so you can be up and running very quickly and then on top of it changing the flow in real time is super important right so during you know from january to november you might be picking at a particular uh, flow in a particular way and then during peak, you might be picking at a completely different rate. And that's, again, because just the demand is so different. I mean, some of our customers getting 10x what they're normally getting during the thing. So how do you design a system that will be able to handle both as opposed to just, you know, design a system that just handles December and the rest of the time is really underutilized? Um, in the past, you used to have to invest a lot of money, millions of dollars, tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars in a particular automation. And if it didn't work, if it didn't do what you expected it to do, you're sort of stuck in there. Uh, instead, the way we positioned our company is we're actually, instead of even selling robots or leasing the robots, uh, we're selling the productivity of the robots. So we become in charge of how many robots we need to maintain there, um, making sure that the robots are as effective as possible. And we're really aligned with our customers because our customers, what they care about is how many orders am I getting out the door? And that's what we basically charge them on is on that rate that it's going out. So I think that um, definitely aligns the incentives between the two and helps uh, both you know, us and our customers to bring these systems into fruition, especially with some you know, that we've talked to have been burnt in the past by very high expensive automation. During peak, uh, you bring a lot of people in who have probably zero idea of what a warehouse even looks like. And they have to get up to speed, they have to get up to productivity levels at extremely fast rate. I mean, they're there for, you know, if anything, for a month at most, but maybe, you know, they got to get from day one, from hour one, to be as productive as possible. The other challenge is that they're also working with systems who are very smart now. It's not, you know, the old way where you told them, well, you just work with this conveyor belt, it's just going to move from point A to point B. You have robots that are making decisions that are doing more complex tasks, which people may or may not uh, have the intuition to understand why is it doing this or that. Uh, so this is two of the problems that we really try to solve out in Invia. And one aspect 
is to make the, the um, interfaces as intuitive as possible. So it's not just using you know, text and things like that, but it's using colors and using other information that is more intuitive to people. And then using AI on the back end to measure how those people are performing to understand if there is an issue. So be able, you know, to alert that right away and to understand that, hey, you know, this person needs more training and you can address that almost on an individual basis, uh, even you know, through the app kind of communicating through this. Um, so doing that, I think the, you know, the way we measure this is how do we bring a person using our system and get them to operate at full speed as quickly as possible, right? So all the interfaces, all the UI, UXs that we're developing uh, have to do with that aspect of it. Um, the other aspect that we have is actually the, like the robot wranglers, the people who are interacting with the robot. So we have people who are just interacting, you know, as pickers, but other ones who are actually, you know, troubleshooting the robots, like I talked about, this is more of the cognitive. That takes a little bit more understanding. Um, luckily, again, a lot of the tools we're trying to create is you don't require a PhD in robotics to do this. So it's something that the warehouse manager uh, can do, but that's also the same thing, right? So some people have some um, intuition, some beliefs, what the robot should do, like you mentioned, and they might act accordingly, but that might not be the right thing to do. So this is why, you know, a tool to really give them the visual aid of what the robot intentions are, what it's going to do next, uh, pre-planning and doing all that stuff is very, very important. And we give that information to the, you know, warehouse manager, to the robot wranglers, so he can understand, okay, what problem am I solving right now? And what is the future consequences to these uh, problems? Um, I think fine manipulation is, is I mean, it, it's coming along quite well, and there are certain products that definitely fit to robot arms, but still, you know, being able to dig inside the toad and pick a small little items among other items is still very difficult. And it's difficult in two terms. One is just the technical challenges that it takes, but the other problem is the cost of them as well. So it's very difficult to justify, and if you build a million dollar robot, that can do it where you have other labor that can do it at, you know, at a cheaper rate. So you're really competing against that as well. Um, so I think the, the other problem is problem solving. So when you have a problem in the warehouse, uh, right now robots don't solve their own problems. They're really good at doing the task day in and day out, but the minute they encounter a particular problem, for example, if you have a pallet lifting robot that comes in, but the pallet is broken and it can't put the forks underneath, um, that pallet a robot is not going to solve the challenge of, you know, how do I fix that? And that's usually where people come in, where they might depalletize it, they might do something else, and figure out a solution that's outside the domain of that uh, robot. Mm -hmm.